Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my Game Week 30 preview where we'll be talking about captaincy, chip strategy, transfers moving forward, yellow cards and much much more. If you do enjoy today's video then please do smash that like button and if you're new around here make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, you might have noticed on my channel if you've been watching for a while, and if you are new, by the way, make sure to subscribe because we do these statistical analyses quite often. But you'll notice for captaincy, I don't really do these analyses. And the reason for that is I'm pretty sure over a four to six game week period, I can say that these players will do fairly well based on fixtures, underlying data, and much, much more. But in a single game, i.e. when you're deciding on captaincy, I do find it very difficult to predict, as does everyone, right? Because anything can happen. It could be that the player's got a terrible fixture, they're not a goal threat, but one of the other players makes a mistake and the ball just falls to that player's feet. So in a single game, I find it quite difficult. It's another reason why on a free hit, I don't look at stats as much, and I often just go based on vibes and gut feeling. And I'm not saying captaincy should always be based on that, but I do find that stats are slightly less useful when we're trying to predict a single game. That being said, this week, there are lots and lots of players that have great underlying data, great fixtures, and people are finding it very difficult, myself included, to choose between them. I think the three popular captains this week that most people will be choosing between are Palmer, Salah, and Son. All three are fantastic players, all have home fixtures too. But there are some other decent options here. So as you can see on your screen, I've got seven options, but I've gone in even more depth than usual. And if you do like this detail, make sure to let me know down below. Maybe I can do this every week for captaincy. So I'll just explain what the table is before I go through each of the players. So I've got non-penalty expected goal involvement, which is a combination of expected goals and expected assists per 90. But I've got that at home for each player, away for each player, and then over the last six for each player. The reason for that is home and away data is very different for different players, but also you might want to see in recent weeks, are there some players that are doing slightly better than others? Remember that Muniz on this list is the only one that is playing away. Everyone else is at home. So if the statistic is underlined, it means obviously that's the one that's relevant to them. So that's the individual data that I've got, those three columns there. And then I've also got opposition defensive data for the final three columns. So what I've got here is the same thing again, opposition defensive data away from home versus at home. And I've got their ranking in the Premier League with first meaning they are the best defense and 20th meaning they are the worst defense. And then what I've also got as the final column is the opposition defensive weakness. So what this is, is where do they concede most of the chances created? So when opposition play against them, where are they creating most of their chances from? Hopefully that is clear. So that's the table that you've got here. And I just thought I'd just go through each player and discuss, are they a good option themselves? What about the matchup? What about the fixture? So starting with Muniz, he's been absolutely brilliant. And I've deliberately avoided putting price on this table here because price is irrelevant, especially with captaincy, but it is difficult. I do think there's certainly a price bias. And I would love to know if you agree with this down below. It feels safe captaining someone like Salah and Haaland because they're so expensive, but that really shouldn't matter. It feels weird captaining a 4.6 million pound asset like Moniz, but he is fantastic. And we've seen with Palmer this season, Palmer's been so cheap, but he's been a great captaincy option in a lot of weeks. So with Moniz, remember he is playing away from home. So at home, Moniz's data is 0.72 per 90, non-penalty non expected goal involvement. So that is really, really good. You can see it's one of the best on the list outside of obviously Salah and Haaland. It's actually the fifth best on this list, similar to the likes of Ollie Watkins. So really good data at home, but he's not playing at home, right? He's playing Sheffield United away and he's away data is 0.37. And actually, Fulham are very, very bad away from Craven Cottage. At Craven Cottage, they're exceptional defensively and also offensively. But away from home, they struggle. And so has Muniz so far this season. So this alone would maybe be enough to put me off of Muniz. But his data over the last six is actually the third best on this list. So he's certainly on a hot streak at the moment. And I'm not saying that he doesn't have the ability to score away from home. But it certainly doesn't look as good as if it was at home. Interestingly, though... Sheffield United at home are the worst defense in the league. So they are 20th. So Sheffield United are actually better away from home. And obviously they are defending at home. So defensive wise, when we're looking at the fixture matchup, this is actually perfect for Moniz. He has got arguably, or not arguably, statistically the best fixture out of all of the players here. Or joint with, we'll discuss that in a second. But he has a very, obviously a very, very good fixture. Then when we look at the opposition defensive weakness, Sheffield United concede most of their chances created down the left flank. What I would say, though, is Muniz is a striker. So 
Sheffield United concede a lot of chances down their flanks. If they're crossing balls in to Moniz, that's great. So I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing when we look at the opposition defensive zones that they're weak from. I think it's actually good for Moniz. Basically, Sheffield United concede a lot of crosses. So this will be good if he can get on the end of those crosses. So fixture-wise... I don't think it could get much better for Moniz, seeing how bad Sheffield United are at home defensively. However, his away data and a, just away performances would put me off slightly. So I do think there are slightly better options than Moniz for me. We then move on to Cole Palmer, and I'm actually finding this one quite interesting because there are some very good things, as we know, but there are also some slightly negative things as well. So being on penalties is a major advantage for Cole Palmer, and his home data is really, really good. In a similar way to Moniz, almost identical sort of stats. Home data, really good at 0.65. Away data, not so good at 0.38. But he is playing at home, so the away data is irrelevant here. My issue is with Cole Palmer, comfortably, and I mean comfortably, the worst data out of all of the players on this list over the last six. So he's got 0.39 per 90 over the last six. The second worst is actually Son at 0.6. So he is in a league of his own, but not in a good way for his attacking data over the last six. And I've just looked at his fixtures because I was like, maybe it's the fixtures. Not necessarily. So over the last six, it's Liverpool, Wolves, Crystal Palace, Man City, Brentford, Newcastle. I mean, Wolves aren't a great defence. Palace have been a bit shaky with their defensive injuries. Brentford have been pretty poor defensively. Newcastle, one of the worst defences. So is this maybe a Chelsea thing as opposed to a Palmer thing? Let me know down below. But Whichever way you look at it, Cole Palmer is definitely not in a good run of form at the moment. He put up 0.14 non-penalty expected goal involvement against Newcastle. I know he got a goal and an assist, but you can't continue to get that attacking output when your data is so weak. So I would be slightly concerned about that with Palmer. However, in a similar way to what I said with Moniz, the fixture is great. Burnley away from home, because obviously Chelsea are playing at home. Away from home, they are 18th for non-penalty expected goals conceded. So they are very, very weak away from home. They are much better at home. So fixture and matchup wise, it's perfect for Palmer and Burnley concede most of their chances down their left side. And I realise that that box should be in green because obviously that will suit Palmer, obviously playing off the right. He does drift centrally quite a lot, but this should suit him in terms of the ability to create chances for his teammates and maybe get chances himself. So I would argue maybe even as much, if not slightly more than Muniz, this fixture really will suit Cole Palmer. His data across the season is great. He's on penalties. My concern, my only concern is his performances over the last six in terms of the amount of chances he's creating and getting hasn't been as good as it has been at other points this season. But Cole Palmer is right up there, definitely in the top three for me for captaincy, and I'm strongly considering it. We've then got Richarlison and Son. I'll do sort of the Spurs boys together that are obviously either side of Watkins in this table. I don't know if Richarlison will be fit enough to start. I assume he will be. And I think if he is, my prediction is that Richarlison goes back in through the middle and Son goes out to the left. But if Richarlison doesn't, I think obviously that makes Richarlison a non-option and it makes Son a much stronger option. I'm not saying that Son won't get opportunities off the left. I think he certainly will. And as you can see right here, if Son is on the left, they can see most, Luton can see most of their chances on their right side. So I actually think this will suit Son a little bit more fixture and matchup wise if he is on the left. But we just know that we, I think we've seen it over enough games now. Sonny is much more dangerous, especially goal threat wise when he plays through the center. So I think if Richarlison does start, it obviously makes Richarlison a serious option, but it will make Son a slightly weaker option, but he's definitely still worth consideration. When we look at their underlying data this season, Richarlison just has better data. 0.74 to Son 0.54 at home. Over the last six, Richarlison has 0.69 to Son 0.6. So it's just, Richarlison just has better open play goal threat and assist threat. He just is a better asset with respect to getting chances. Now, what I would say is there's two things that puts you back in favor of Son. Son is one of the best finishers the Premier League has ever seen, arguably top three finishers in world football. That's not an opinion. The stats back that up. His conversion rate is absolutely unbelievable. And Son is on penalties and his minutes will be better than Richarlison. So there's actually three things that put it back in favor of Son. So whilst I do like Richarlison's underlying data more than Son, and I think he is an, a bigger open play goal threat when we're looking at him playing through the center and Son on the left. I think the penalties, minutes, and the nature of Son's finishing still make Son a better option for me. So therefore, I still favor Son, but I think Richarlison, if we get the nod that he's starting, or if you strongly believe that he will, I still think he's a good option. I still think he is, but the minutes just put me off slightly. And like I said, I think Son is just such a good FPL option. When we look at the defensive data for Luton away from home, because again, Spurs are playing at home, 
is perfect again. So Sheffield United are the weakest defence at home, which suits Moniz. And then Luton are the weakest defence away from home, which suits Richarlison and Son. So now we're looking at Moniz, Palmer, Richarlison and Son. Fixtures wise, I mean, they, it couldn't get any better for them, really. They are playing the weakest defences at the home versus away where they are weakest, essentially. So really, really good. And you can see there's a bit of a myth that like Luton are really good at home. I mean, attacking wise, they are slightly better at home, but they're still the second worst defence in the league at home as well. But definitely away from home, they are comfortably the weakest. So fixtures wise, definitely if you are targeting fixtures only, it kind of has to be for me, Muniz, Palmer or one of Richarlison or Son. But there is much more to it than just fixtures, of course. So that's it on Richarlison and Son. I would have Sonny above Richarlison, but I do still like Richarlison as an option. Just briefly on Ollie Watkins, because for me, he's not really in the top three, but I still think he's worth considering. I won't own him on my wild card, so I'm slightly nervous about that. But you can see across the season, he's got the third best stage on this league. We know that actual output wise as well. He's been absolutely brilliant. He could even finish the season as the top scoring player in FPL, which would be a remarkable feat. And next season, I expect him to be 10 million plus. Let me know down below what you think Ollie Watkins' price next season will be. So at home, he's much stronger than away. And that's good because he's playing at home. Over the last six, he actually has the fourth best data on this list. It's not really dropped off in recent weeks either. So consistently very, very good attacking data. The issue that I've got is actually Wolves are better defensively away from Molyneux. So at home, they're 16th in the league for expected goals conceded non-penalty. So they are not very good defensively at home, but away from home, they're 7th. So this doesn't look like a fixture that's particularly great for Ollie Watkins with respect to the fact that Wolves are good defensively away from home. And we have seen at points... They've not been bad, I wouldn't say. It may be slightly worse than we expected. Basically, Aston Villa's home data has certainly weakened in recent weeks and months. They started the season remarkably. They went on that incredible run at home, but we've seen that drop off a little bit. So I don't think Villa Park is the fortress that it was early on in the season. And therefore, I think in combination with the fact that Watkins isn't on penalties... I think other people have slightly better fixtures as well. And I also do, if possible, prefer to captain a midfielder. I just don't think I would have Watkins in my top three or five. But I think he's worth considering just due to the fact that he's been so consistent and his data is so strong as well. So I like Ollie Watkins, but not for me. And then we move on to Salah and Haaland, who are obviously the two best assets. When we look at the data, look, you, you can see by the colour scheme and the numbers... Haaland is the best asset in, in FPL and, and Salah is the second best asset in FPL. And we've known that for a while. So Haaland and Salah both sit about a 0.9 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 at home, which is just, it's silly data. That's non-penalty, that's silly data. So we know how good they are at home and they're both playing at home. Interestingly, Haaland's actually been very good away from home this season. Last season, he had a similar sort of data set to what we can see from Salah. So there was a bit of an, a notable drop off away from home. But this season, away from home, he's still very, very good. So Haaland away or at home, really decent. But traditionally, what we've seen from Haaland is Haaland actually struggles away from home against big six sides. And he's pretty good away from home against easy opposition or at least weaker opposition. But this season, he's just shown consistently good data. Over the last six, I've actually had to choose Salah's last six rather than the last six game weeks. Because in the last six game weeks, Salah's only played 85 minutes. So I've done Salah's last six and then Haaland's last six. And they're both even better over the last six. So they're set up there at zero point, basically just one expected goal involvement per 90, non-penalty. So these are comfortably the two best assets. None of the other players in this list get close to them. But the issue is they have comfortably the most difficult two fixtures here. You can see pretty much every other team here has a really good fixture, bar maybe Ollie Watkins considering that Wolves are better away from home. But Salah and Haaland do just have the two most difficult fixtures here. So it's this classic debate of do you choose the better assets with the most difficult fixtures or do you choose still good assets but with the better fixtures? And that really comes down to who you are as a manager. But just quickly on the defensive data of the teams they're playing... I mean, Arsenal are just unbelievable. They are comfortably the best defense in the league this season. At home and away from home, they are first. So you can't get a more difficult fixture. And therefore, as good as Haaland is, I just don't think I can consider him for captaincy this week, given that Arsenal are that good. My only slight caveat to that is, obviously, this is a title-deciding game. Not necessarily this early is it literally going to decide the title, but I would not be surprised if Arsenal, Liverpool and City finish within three points of each other. And if that's the case, this is, they call it a six point game because you're taking points off your opposition and you're also gaining points yourself. So it is absolutely massive. And therefore, I think this will go one of two ways. I think it'll either be a bit of a stalemate where they're kind of both don't want to lose or they'll absolutely go for it and we could see a goal fest. I'm not sure which one it will be, 
But if you do think this could be a goal fest, let me know down below if you think it will go that way. Then Haaland could still be a decent captaincy shout. And whilst Arsenal don't concede many chances, they do concede most of their chances created through the center of the pitch, whereas obviously, which is where the likes of Haaland will operate. So not the fixture for me. I can't consider him personally because I play very much based on fixtures, but he is still worth considering always. On Salah, the, the data for Brighton is actually very good. They are the fourth best defense in the league away from home this season. So when I'm saying I'm a fixtures-based manager, by that definition, I, I really shouldn't necessarily be considering Salah as much. Across the season at home, Brighton are eighth for non-penalty expected goals conceded. So Brighton are just a very good defense. They obviously went that very long spell at the start of the season without keeping a clean sheet. But I think that was quite unlucky at points. And it was just individual errors and maybe a few decent shots from the opposition. Brighton do concede most of their chances created from the left and from the centre, which is obviously exactly where Salah will operate. Salah operates on the right and through the middle too. So opposition defensive data-wise, not great for Salah, but opposition weakness-wise, it's perfect. And we do know that Brighton do struggle, whether they play Esther Pignan or Igor, whoever they play at that left-back spot, whether it be Lamptey, they're not necessarily the strongest defenders. So I do. I think I actually captain Salah in the reverse fixture against Brighton earlier in the season, and that went very well for me. I think Salah does like these kind of games, and Brighton will certainly be a team that push up. So matchup-wise, I don't think it's bad for Salah, but data-wise, I can't ignore it. Brighton are a good defence. So which way are we going? Let me know down below what you're currently considering for captaincy. I do still think everything together it is still Salah, Son, or Palmer. <laughs> and I've just spent a f far too long to just give you the very obvious answer. I think putting it all together, I would probably just about say objectively now, Palmer is the slightly better option if you can get over the fact that the last six he's not been great. Just given that he's on penalties, his minutes are very secure, we know exactly what we're going to get from Palmer positioning-wise, and the matchup against Burnley looks very, very good for him, given where they concede lots of their chances and their defensive data away from home. My concern with Son... Because you can say all of that about Son. My concern with Son is we just think he is slightly weaker pushed out to the left. And if Richarlison does start, I just think it makes Sonny slightly weaker. And we do also know, maybe it's a bit of a myth, but Son is slightly better against teams that push way up the pitch. And I think Luton will go slightly more low block here. So I don't know if that suits Sonny as much. So for me, it's probably just about Palmer as a slightly better option than the other two. Then I would probably say Salah and Son are equal, given the fact that how difficult Salah's fixture is in comparison to Son's. But I am slightly leaning Salah ahead of Son, just based on the fact that it is Mohamed Salah and how good he is. So I've got them currently as just about Palmer, Salah, Son. I may still go for Salah, though simply because I think he will be quite lowly owned in comparison to the rest of the season. And it's kind of a risk I'm willing to take. Despite me thinking Palmer could be ever so slightly better, Salah's ownership I think will be the lowest. And I quite like taking a gamble at this point in the season. So there we go. Palmer, Salah, Son. Let me know what you think down below the captaincy discussion. Right, guys, I promised throughout last week and going into this week that I would do this for you because I'm getting so many questions about, yes, Ross, we've, we, we know what you'd do if you've got wildcard free hit and bench boost, but what if you've only got X and Y? Or what if you've got X, Y, Z? Or what if you don't want a wildcard this week, you could do it this week. So I'm sure I've somehow still missed a, a combination of chips here that you have, and sorry if that is the case, but hopefully based on this list, you can work it out yourself. So what I've got is when I would like to ideally play each of the chips, and then I've got based on the combination of chips, which weeks do I think objectively based on not seeing your team, they should be played. But of course, this is team dependent. I, if I think that for some reason with the chips you've got that wildcard 30 or 31 is best, but you're like, my team looks fine, then of course go for a different strategy and wildcard a bit later, just as an example. So whilst I still think this is largely accurate, it does still depend on your team. You can see for each of the chip combinations, I've tried to provide one, which is my favorite, and then an alternative if you don't like my favorite option. If you do appreciate me going through and trying to strategize for every single chip, make sure to drop a like on the video and please do subscribe as well if you're new around here. So briefly before I go into each of the strategies, feel free to, by the way, just look at it and then move on to the next section for your own chip strategy. But if I still had, well, obviously, if you have the free hit, I think the best week to play the free hit is in either game week 34 or game week 37, because these are the two big double game weeks for the remainder of the season. Game week 34, we have seven teams doubling. Game week 36, we have six teams doubling. The teams doubling in 34 
are completely different to the teams doubling in 37. No team double in both. Therefore, the best time to play your free hit is to cover you in 34 or to cover you in 37. And this will be dependent upon what your team looks like right now. I think I personally prefer free hit 34 based on what most teams look like. But if your team already looks well set up, go in 37. Wildcard wise, I think there are three good weeks to wildcard. Now, next week, when there's a big fixture swing for the likes of Liverpool and Arsenal, and then 35, which is after that double game week 34, when you can load up on teams for the back end of the season. So I think wildcard in one of those three, I don't like 33, I don't like 34, as some people have been talking about. 32 kind of makes sense, but I feel like I would rather just go in 30 or 31. So that's wildcard. Bench boost, I think you either go in 34 or 37 again, the two biggest double game weeks, but I also really like game week 36, because if you have five or six players from Spurs and Chelsea who are likely to double in 36. It could be 35, by the way, but let's go on the basis it's 36. The likes of Arsenal play against Bournemouth. I think Brentford have got Fulham. You've got a Man United maybe against Crystal Palace off the top of my head. So a lot of the teams that you would end up having to bench assets from, they're pretty good. Like, I think I looked at my bench that week and I've got Garnacho against Palace. I think it's Lascelles against Burnley. And then if I've got Pickford in there, I think he has a decent fixture too. And I'm like, do you know what? It's not a bad bench boost. So I quite like bench boost 36 if you don't want to do it in 34 or 37. And then finally, triple captaincy would be in the same three weeks. So 34 or 37 again, or on Cole Palmer in either 35 or 36 whenever he doubles. I actually really like triple captaincy on Cole Palmer. Even though it's not going to be a perfect double, I just think he's such a good option. So that's when I would be playing the chips. And then you can see based on that, I've just gone through the best combinations. So I'll fly through some of these, maybe not in all of them because it's going to take too long. But free hit wise, I've just spoken about 34 or 37. Wild card, if you've only got the wild card, I would prefer to play it in 35 because as I said, 34 and 37 is essentially going to require two completely different teams. So I just think you are better off wild carding after game week 34 and sort of dead ending into that game week. But I also think you could set up a decent team in 30 or 31. If you've only got the bench boost, I think you'll probably find it easier to bench boost in 36 than 37, but I don't mind either of those weeks. And triple captain wise, I think the best remaining triple captain this season is probably going to be Mohamed Salah, but you could go in 37 on someone, sorry, in 34 on Mohamed Salah, but you could go in 37 on Haaland if the league isn't wrapped up at that point, or like I said, even a Cole Palmer in 35 or 36. But I think if I had only the triple captain left, I'd be playing it on Salah in 34. When it starts to get a little bit more confusing is then when you've got two chips available. So wildcard and free here. I do still think the best strategy is wildcard now. Load up on good teams that also double in 37. Man United, Newcastle were two decent teams you could load up on. Chelsea and Spurs also serve you very well. Free hit in 34 because your team will look a mess in that week. And then you've got a really decent team for the back end of the season. But I also don't mind free hit in 34. Basically, just make transfers as you normally would in the lead up to 34, free hit in 34, and then wildcard out of that. I think that's absolutely fine. For wildcard and bench boost, definitely the best strategy is to wildcard into a bench boost. So wildcard in 35 and bench boost in 37. But if your team looks a bit of a mess now, as I just spoke about, I think wildcarding around now and then bench boosting in 37 will also serve you fairly well. Free hit and bench boost. I think free hit, like I said, will go in 34 or 37 and then the bench boost will go in the other game week. So whether that be 37 and then free hit 34 or bench boost 34 and free hit 37. So I think if you've got those two chips, you just play them in the other, the, the, the two game weeks where there's big doubles and you decide which way based on your own team that currently looks. Wildcard and triple captain, you either triple captain 34, wildcard 35 or you wildcard now and triple captain 34. I think, as I said, if you've got the triple captain available and no free hit, triple captain in 34 makes sense to me. Free hit and triple captain. I think if you've got the free hit and triple captain, you've got that debate around which ones you play in game week 34. So for me, free hit 34, triple captain 36 is probably the best strategy and that triple captain on Cole Palmer. Or you've got the triple captain 34, which le therefore leaves you the free hit in 37. And then the final two chip combination, I know I'm flying through this, is triple captain and bench boost. I do think bench boost in 36 or 37 makes the most sense. If you want to go in 36, then I would triple captain 34. Or if you're happy bench boosting 37, that obviously opens up the opportunity like I said, to triple captain a Cole Palmer or Hyung Min Son in that Chelsea and Spurs double, which we think will be in 36. Finally, then if you've got the three chips remaining, wildcard free hit bench boost, which is exactly what I've got. I think the best strategy for me, and especially if your team's not perfect at the moment, is to wildcard in one of the upcoming two game weeks, free hit in 34, and then bench boost in 37. You load up on the assets that will serve you well for the remainder of the season. You can free hit to deal with that game week 34, 
And then you can bench boost with the likes of Man United, Newcastle, City, Chelsea, Spurs. I think it's a really, really nice strategy. But if your team looks really good now, you could still free hit in 34, but then wild card in 35, which will set you up for a much better bench boost, I'm sure, in 37. So if your team doesn't need a wild card now, that second strategy is absolutely fine. If you've got wild card, triple captain, bench boost, everything other than the free hit, I think the best strategy is to try and wildcard after that game week 34. Like I said, two different teams required in 34 and 37. So triple captain in 34, wildcard 35, and then bench boost in either 36 or 37. But I do still think you can get away with wildcarding now, just using your triple captain in 34 rather than the free hit and still bench boosting in 37. And then the final three chip strategy is free hit, 30, free hit triple captain and bench boost. In this situation... I would free hit in 34 preferably, triple captain Cole Palmer or Chung Min Son, and then bench boost in 37. But if you prefer to triple captain Salah rather than free hit in 34, you just simply go triple captain 34, bench boost 36, and free hit 37 instead. The only other strategy I can think of that isn't covered so far is if you have all of your remaining chips, i.e. all four of them, which is great if you still do. In that case, I would still prefer, for most people, unless your team is really well set up, wild card now, free hit in 34, triple captain Son or Palmer in that small double, and then bench boost 37. But as I said, a perfectly good strategy if your team is fine for now is free hit 34, wild card 35, triple captain 36, and bench boost 37. So you'll be playing all four of your chips in four games weeks and that would look very very good the only final thing I wanted to say on this because I know a lot of people will question it I spoke about before free hit 38 being really really nice and I don't mind it because if things are wrapped up we might see a bit of rotation my concern with free hit 38 is the players that you will already own have really good fixtures the likes of Chelsea I think Chelsea have Bournemouth Spurs I think you have Sheffield United off the top of my head Man United have Brighton Arsenal have someone like an Everton or something like that. City have a decent... Basically, all of the teams that you would own players from, they have good fixtures anyway in 38. So I would urge you to build your team as it will be. Look at it in 38 and just think, I don't know that a free hit will gain me that much. You are heavily, heavily relying on there being lots of rotation and other people struggling. Because if there isn't as much rotation, there's really nothing to gain with a free hit 38 for me. So therefore, these are the best combinations of transfers. Sorry for that being a bit rambly and repetitive, but hopefully I've covered everyone there. And if I haven't, drop a comment down below and I'll try to help you too. So guys, this section will be a lot quicker, I'm sure. I promise, actually, I'll make this section quicker. So I just wanted to discuss players that are at risk of suspension, those on seven, eight, or nine yellow cards. So just to confirm, once a player reaches 10 yellow cards, they are suspended for two games. Not one as it is with five yellows, but two games. However... After the team that the player plays for has played 32 Premier League games, so not in other competitions, 32 Premier League games, this is then wiped. So basically, that player has to get to 32 games, or their team has to have played 32 games for the 10 yellow cards to no longer cause a suspension. So what I've got here is the players that are on 7, 8, and 9 yellow cards, and then in brackets, the game week that they have to get through for that to obviously be white. So for certain teams like Chelsea, Chelsea have played, I think, only 27 Premier League games, maybe even less than that. I think it's 27, whereas some teams have played 29. So for example, I think Aston Villa have played 29, Chelsea have played 27. So Chelsea have to get through more game weeks for the suspensions to be wiped. So those players on seven yellow cards are, and these are only the ones of note, there are further ones, but the ones of Premier League note, I think for us, Branthwaite needs to get through game week 33 before the suspension is lifted. So just before that double game week 34 for Everton. So I don't think it's a massive risk given that he'd have to pick up three further yellows. So 30, 31, 32, 33. Basically, in the next four weeks, he'd have to pick up three yellow cards. I don't think that will happen, so I don't think he's a massive risk. Same with Dawson. Maybe you're not considering Dawson right now, but he might not be available potentially for that double game week 34. Havertz, again, maybe not a player that you're considering this week, but if he picks up another one next week, maybe puts you off slightly. But I do think the players largely on seven are okay. The only one I'll be slightly more concerned about is Cole Palmer, because obviously Cole Palmer has to get through one further game week because Chelsea have played so few fixtures. So if Palmer picks up a yellow in 30, he's then got to get through like four game weeks essentially without picking up two yellows. So that will get slightly more concerning. But again, those players on seven yellows, it's not going to put me off massively. Those players on eight, we've got Douglas Luiz, but he has to get through fewer game weeks because obviously Aston Villa have played more games. So Douglas Luiz on eight yellow cards. Senesi, if he's back and available and you're considering picking him ahead of that double game week 34, He's on eight yellows. Bruno Fernandes, if you're looking to pick up a Man United asset that's not Garnacho and Hoyland, Bruno Fernandes is on eight yellows and he is very, very susceptible to picking up silly yellow cards. 
And then the two that I think are most of note are Gordon and Darwin, who both have to get through game week 33 before that 10 game suspension is wiped. So that's slightly more concerning to me. But again, I think you'd be very unlucky to get both of them. So if you wanted to go for Gordon and Darwin on your wild card, I'm pretty sure I'd be okay with that. But just do note that if you get very unlucky, you could be sat in a position where you don't have either of them, which obviously would not be particularly ideal, especially if you're bringing Darwin in ahead of double game week 34 and you want to keep him in that. It could prove a potential issue. There is only one player in the Premier League on nine yellow cards, and that is Jackson. And in a similar way to Palmer, he's got to get through that Arsenal at home game in game week 34. I think it's at home. Arsenal game in game week 34 before the suspension is lifted. Therefore, I think Jackson is the main one on this list. It's the reason I'm not picking him on wildcard. And it could go badly. If he scores a hat-trick against Burnley, it doesn't matter about getting the suspension. So it could go really badly. But I just don't know that I can bring in a player that's got to get through like five or six game weeks without picking up another yellow. It just feels... I think it's five game weeks, sorry. It just feels very, very unlikely based on the fact that he's already on nine yellow cards. So that would maybe put me off Jackson ever so slightly. So those are the players at risk of suspension. Let me know how many you're currently going to have in your game week 30 team. So I'm going to fly through some of the questions that you had around wildcard 30. If you're not wildcarding in 30, you don't really care about this. You just skip to the next section because there are further questions that I've answered in that final section of the video. But if you are wildcarding this week or at least considering it, there are just a few questions that people wanted me to address. So how much do we need Arsenal? I think the answer to this is not that much. But I do think it's probably worth having an attacker from Arsenal. So Arsenal obviously play against City away this week. One of the most difficult fixtures in the league. You certainly don't need lots of Arsenal this week. But in 31, they've got Luton at home. And I just think Luton at home is a fantastic fixture. You're going to want Saka or at least an Arsenal attacker in that game. Preferably a defender as well would be very, very useful. After that, though, if you're free hitting in 34, which I assume you are if you've asked this question, they've got Brighton and Aston Villa, which defensively, I could see both Brighton and Aston Villa scoring. Of course, Arsenal are the best defence in the league, so I'm not saying that there isn't a clean sheet potential there. But those aren't games where I'm desperate to have the likes of Gabriel and Saliba. But I would still like Saka because Arsenal are going to continue scoring goals. They are scoring goals for fun at the moment. And the league is right up there for grabs. So they are going to have to keep scoring. So I do think that at least one attacker makes a lot of sense. But I don't think a defender is essential. When you consider that other teams have good fixtures in 31. For example, if you go for 8 Nuri instead of Gabriel. 8 Nuri has Burnley away in game at 31. I would happily go up against Gabriel with eight Nuri with the attacking threat that he's got. And then when you consider that I don't think they'll get two clean sheets in 32 and 33, I think they've got the chance for one potentially. And then you're free hitting in 34. I think you'd look to sell them in 35 against Spurs anyway, ahead of that bench boost potentially in 37. So I don't think you need desperately an Arsenal defender, but I do think it would be smart to go for at least one Arsenal attack would be my perspective on it. The next question, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, I'm sure, but are we going to be punished by Solanke Watkins? Most probably. <laughs> They've got really good fixtures this week. I am still considering Solanke myself, potentially, on wildcard, maybe instead of Darwin, considering he's... The fact that he's got that midweek fixture against Sheffield United, he's had issues with his hamstrings recently. I think there's a chance Darwin's rested. So could Solanke outscore Darwin over the next three? Absolutely. And you could argue that Ollie Watkins too, with two decent fixtures, either side of the Man City fixture. But you have to remember, you're not just going without Slanky and Watkins. You've got the likes of Darwin and Isaac instead. So if you genuinely don't think that Darwin and Isaac are as good as or slightly better options this week and longer term, then just don't go with Darwin and Isaac. Go with Solanke and Watkins if you want to. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. It is a little bit scary this week given they've both got two good home fixtures and they are both very good assets. So I am slightly fearful of that, but I back that my other players could do very well. The next question was, do we need three Chelsea and three Spurs given the fact that they are going to double in one of 35 or 36 and also 37? My answer to this is definitely no. But I would say you need at least four would be my number. The reason I say that is I quite like the idea of leaving the third option open for both. So I was actually discussing with Zoff of the FPL Wire this. He really wants to leave that spot open for Nicholas Jackson for Chelsea. So in my wildcard draft, I've got Petrovic, Gusto and Palmer. But if Jackson continues to perform well, maybe picks up his 10th yellow and then he's got the suspension out of the way and he's back ready for sort of 35 onwards there is a good chance that you maybe want Jackson instead of one of the defensive options. And if you load up on three Chelsea, you block that. And it's kind of the same with Spurs. Let's say you've got, I don't know, like let's say you go Udogi, Poro and Son. 
what if Richarlison just starts every game, maybe takes a penalty ahead of Son, all of a sudden you're going to have to sell one of your Spurs defenders to then bring in Richarlison. So I quite like the option of two Chelsea, two Spurs because you've got some in place, but you're leaving yourself open to if you want to add a third, you can pretty much choose freely who that is. So I would say a minimum of four personally for me on a wildcard 30 unless you've got no free hit in 34, in which case you can go slightly slightly less. But I think for most people, I would go for four from them. I've currently got six currently on my wild card, but that's because I want to make sure my team is well set up for the future. The next question is sort of related to Spurs. Is wildcard 30, bench boost 34, free hit 37 overlooked? In 35 or 36, you don't need Spurs really. So what this comment was, I've shortened it slightly, is they don't think the Spurs doubles look great. And definitely the one in 35 or 36 won't be particularly good. And they do have a difficult run of fixtures in the middle for Spurs. So, so from the blank in 34 to third, the first fixture, I suppose, of 37 against Man City, Spurs fixtures are really, really weak. They are not good. However, I would argue that some of the Spurs assets will perform regardless of the fixture. In particular, I'm looking at Hyung Min Son. But then you have to look at the fixtures outside of that. The fixtures over the next lot are really, really good for Spurs. They've got Luton, West Ham, Forest, Newcastle. Attacking-wise, I like that. Defensively, it's not bad. Home fixtures against Luton and Forest. And then their final two games of the season, which will be one of the fixtures in 37 and 38, is Burnley and Sheffield United. So what you're telling me, if you go largely without Spurs, or wait to bring them in, I suppose, but if you go without them, you're missing out on that really nice run of fixtures now and those really nice two fixtures to end the season. So I, I think for me, I, I still prefer the idea of free hit 34, bench boost 37. But if you think genuinely Spurs aren't worth investing in, you could just go into 34 with only Cole Palmer, come out of that bench boost in 34, bring in a Gusto, then bring in a Hyung Min Son, and just have like two from Chelsea and one from Spurs. I don't hate that, but I just, I don't think that bench boost 34 is that good that it's worth giving up all of those extra Spurs and Chelsea players. So for me, no. I prefer wildcard 30, bench boost 37, free hit, um, bench boost 37 and free hit 34. That's my personal strategy. But yes, maybe it's being slightly overlooked and you should at least consider doing it. So guys, here are some other questions that have been asked, but feel free to ask more questions in the comments. And like I said, if you are new to the channel and you've watched to this point and you're not yet subscribed, please do consider subscribing. I do really appreciate it. So the first question, who is more important for Game Week 30, Salah or Palmer? And I'm going to flip this question back on you if you're wondering this. If Son didn't exist, who would you captain in 30? Maybe you wouldn't captain Son anyway, but let's say your answer is I was going to captain Son. Let's say Son doesn't exist. Who would you captain out of Salah and Palmer? And I think that's your answer there, because I think both are great options this week. Both you're going to want long term as well. But in order, in terms of who you should prioritize this week, who do you think you would captain? And I think that gives you the idea. If you're just like Palmer, well, then Palmer. If you think it's Salah, then Salah. If you're really not sure, then flip a coin. But I think that will answer your question for you. I just think entry point wise, if you don't get Palmer this week, you don't get him in 31 either because he plays against Manchester United. So the entry point for Palmer is then 32. So I suppose if you go Salah this week, you could then go for an Arsenal asset in 31 and then Palmer in 32. I don't mind that. If you don't go for Salah this week, you have to get him next week against Sheffield United. So it depends on what plan transfers you have and what entry point you want. I would maybe just about say, based on that transfer strategy that I said, maybe Salah now, Arsenal asset 31, Palmer 32 gives you... Brighton this week for Salah, Sheffield United for Salah next week, and a, an Arsenal asset for Luton, and then Palmer for, for Sheffield United in game week 32. I think that gives you the best run of fixtures. Another question on Salah, if I want Salah for game week 31 anyway, do I do it for free next week, or should I take a minus four this week? So I think some people are like, I could roll a transfer this week, do it for free next week, or do I do it for a minus four this week? I think the answer to this is largely, who are you selling? If you've got like Ivan Tony, I'm not saying it's a bad option this week, and that is your route. You do Tony to Moniz, and then one of your midfielders that you don't think is that great anyway. Maybe it's even like a Phil Foden up to Salah. I like that a lot more than if your options are, let's say that the two players that you need to sell are Watkins and Madison, who I think I've seen a few people like, I need to downgrade Watkins and upgrade Madison. You're selling Watkins and Madison ahead of Luton and Wolves at home for a minus four to bring in Salah for what is a difficult fixture on paper then I'm less sure about that. So I think if the players that you're selling have difficult fixtures and or you're not that keen on anyway, I would do it this week for the minus four, especially if you're looking to captain. But if they are good players with fixtures that you don't really want to sell this week, then I would maybe just wait and do it next week for free. But let me know what your dilemmas are with Salah down below. There was a few questions about Kieran Trippier. Someone actually said Kieran Trippier has to be talked about. Given the fixtures, surely he is almost essential. 
And I think the issue that we've got now is we want Son, Salah, and Haaland, plus probably Saka, maybe alongside an Isaac, Darwin, or Watkins, or two of them. Therefore, you are looking at a hell of a lot of money invested into the attack. Then when you consider that we are going to be bench boosting soon, a lot of us, we probably need eight attackers, not seven, that are good and playing. I just don't know where you get the money for Trippier. Unless you've got insane team value, or unless you're going with Muniz and Garnacho and Gordon, like you've got a few cheaper assets in the attack. And I just don't think it's worth sacrificing some of those expensive attackers to get Kieran Trippier. Because the issue with Trippier is you need the clean sheets to go with the attacking returns. And whilst the fixtures are up there, and we do think that Newcastle will still keep a few clean sheets at least with those fixtures, the attacking threat alone isn't quite enough for me. And also, he has been suffering a little bit more so this season with the odd niggle here and there, and he's not completely injury-free. So is there a chance he gets a rest at some point? Maybe. So I just think for those reasons, Kieran Trippier is definitely not essential. But if you've got really good team value and you feel like you're not sacrificing your attack and you can get Trippier in without, like I said, making any sacrifices elsewhere, then go for it. If I had unlimited funds every single week, Kieran Trippier would be in my wildcard draft, but I just don't have that. Question four was, are there any transfer tips to dead end into 34? Absolutely, I've got you covered. This week, Liverpool, 31 Arsenal, and then 32, 33, 34, you're looking at maybe just moving more in Liverpool and Arsenal in, and then you're starting to load up on Wolves and Palace. Palace will probably be in game week 34 that you bring them in because they have a difficult fixture in 32 and 33. Wolves, you can bring in from 31 or 32. So I think it would go Liverpool this week, Arsenal next week, and once you made sure you're fully loaded up on them, you can start to look at Wolves and Crystal Palace, and maybe you could add a Bournemouth player in there as well, because Bournemouth's run of fixtures into 34 are very, very good, but it would definitely be Liverpool and Arsenal that I'd be targeting. For question five, people are wondering, how do we set up a wild card this week if we've already used the free hit, which I guess I haven't really spoken about too much, and I think in this situation, you still have largely the same group of players, but I think there are a few key differences. I think you go a lot heavier on Liverpool, but specifically Arsenal, because of that Dublin 34, so I think you'll have three Liverpool and at least two Arsenal assets. You might have a sprinkling in there of the likes of Solanke, Crystal Palace and Wolves, whereas I probably won't on my 30 wild card. And then the other thing I think will be different is Manchester United. I think they're a critical team because they have that double in 37, but in 34, no, they don't double. They play Sheffield United at home. So I think you could get away with Garnacho and Onana or Dallow in your team, and it will serve you okay for 34, but also allow you to have decent fixtures for that game at 37 double two. So I think Manchester United are a team that would be even more keen to, to load up on, along with Arsenal, Bournemouth, Wolves and Palace, that would be different if you don't have the free hit in your wildcarding this week. And then the final question was around what is the best strategy for those that wildcarded in game week 28? And I think what I would recommend is look at those wildcard teams that you can build or others are building that are wildcarding this week and just what, what do you need to get to get to a point where if you're in the ideal position, those would be your players. So I think you probably need to look to get Salah in. I think if you don't have three Spurs, they're still worth investing in. I think add a couple of Chelsea if you don't currently have them. Look to remove your Luton assets. Maybe hold on to your Bournemouth assets, dependent upon when you want to free hit and stuff like that. But just basically build a wildcard team for this week and see which players you have that you want to start removing and which players you want to bring in. But just think about prioritizing as well. You don't have to have the perfect team every week, but I'll probably be looking at Salah very soon and Chelsea and Spurs as being some of the better teams to invest in. So hopefully that helps. Like I said, if there are any further questions, let me know down below in the comments. So guys, there you have it. That is my game week 30 preview. Another very, very long video, but hopefully you could skip to the sections you enjoyed. And if you watched the entire thing, let me know down below and make sure to like and subscribe as well. I do really appreciate it. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.